my friends, for centuries, Spain was a great international power. These days, we have pretty much no choice but to recognize that those times, they're gone forever. However, there is one area in which Spain continues to be a world reference. And no, I am not referring to the fact that it perfectly illustrates what not to do when it comes to fighting a global pandemic. I'm referring to the fact that, oddly enough, Spain is one of the main players in the military shipbuilding business. For more than a decade, its export share in the global market has exceeded 10%, well above Spain's share of world GDP, which is less than 2%. The problem is, is that the reputation in the military naval industry looked about to sink a few years ago. And yes, that is the first ship pun you will hear in this episode. There's more to come. It was all hands to battle stations in 2003 when we read news stories like this one. Spain just spent $680 million on a submarine that can't swim. QZ. Yes, that is right. No need to rewind. Spain built a submarine that can't float. A vessel that, if it had been put in the water, would have gone to the bottom, which is good for a submarine, but without the key part of being able to resurface again. And the worst thing is that this was not just any project. The SAC class submarines were conceived by the public company Navantia, with the aspiration of being one of the most advanced submarines in the world, just one level below the large nuclear submarines. But hold on one moment, because seven years have passed since then, and Spain has been working hard to resolve this disaster. And of course, as I just mentioned, Navantia is a public company, something that also happens in the naval industry of other European countries, such as France or Italy. So the issue, as you can imagine, is that the efforts to realize this project have also meant that the investment required has multiplied. That is to say, millions have continued to leak out of the Spanish public coffers to try and get the S-80 submarine to float. Something that it seems may, fingers crossed, finally happen next spring. So now the questions are, why has the S-80 class gone through so many problems. What is so special that this submarine is being talked about as one of the most advanced in the world? And perhaps the most important question of all, is it worth the investment Spain has made in the project? Today on Visual Politic, we are going to answer all of these questions with a lot of ship puns. But first, let's take a dive and a look at a little bit of history. Bella Epoque. The S-80 is by no means the first submarine to be built in Spain. Keep in mind, my friends, we are talking about a country that is a pioneer in the development of submersibles. Although the first mechanically propelled submarine was French, just one year later, in 1864, the Catalan Narcis Montreal developed the first submarine using an air-independent combustion engine, the Incenio II. But undoubtedly, the decisive step for making submersibles become weapons of war was the work of another Spanish inventor, Lieutenant Isaac Peral. Born in Cartagena, home of Spain's main military arsenal for the Mediterranean Sea, Isaac Peral decided at a very young age to follow the family tradition of serving in the Navy. Over the years, he had an intense military career and was stationed in the last vestiges of the Spanish Empire, Cuba and the Philippines. However, cancer forced him to devote himself to teaching in a naval academy, a new career path from which he focused all of his efforts on developing his idea to build a new submersible. And in 1888, his dream bubbled to the surface. Isaac Peral achieved the first electric propulsion submarine that also incorporated a system to fire torpedoes under the sea, which I'm told is handy for a submarine. However, the end of the 19th century brought a serious crisis for Spain due to the so-called disaster of 98. That year, a war with the United States caused Spain to lose Cuba, Puerto Rico, Guam and the Philippines, the bulk of its already meagre colonial empire. So Peral's invention quickly fell down into the depths, and that was the end of Spain leading the way in the race to dominate the seabed. The fact is that, although Isaac Peral's submarine was built in the arsenal of La Caraca and sailed for the first time in the Bay of Cadiz, since 1918, the Cartagena arsenal became the main shipyard and naval base for submersibles in Spain. The company that has managed the Cartagena shipyard over the last 100 or so years has been given various names, such as Naval, Bazan, and Izar, to finally end up with the current one, Navantia. Over the years, this company has built some 30 submarines with a common denominator. The design of the submersible was always of foreign origin. It has worked with US, German, and particularly French designs after decades of collaboration with France's state-owned company, now called Naval Group. 
Several types of Spanish submersibles have been built in the Cartagena shipyard. The B, C and D classes, the SEAL and SHARK classes, and with the French as technological partners in the 1970s, they produced the Dolphin class submarines. And in the 80s, the Agosta class, also known as Galerna class or the S-70 class. But my friends, the late 1980s and 90s were a tough time for Cartagena. There was an industrial restructuring that resulted in massive layoffs, serious protests and a lack of orders. So the shipyard had to change its strategy regarding submarines. A consortium was then formed with France to build submarines destined directly for export. This is how the Scorpion class came about, of which two submersibles were sold to Chile and two others to Malaysia. We are talking about a French designed submarine designed by engineers of the current naval group and built partly by this French company and partly by the Spanish one, Navantia. The point is that although Spain even considered the acquisition of several Scorpion in submarines, there was something that the Spanish Ministry of Defence did not like, and that was that France had a greater share, 65% against the Spanish 35% in the consortium in charge of that submarine. So the government of the time, led by José María Anzar, decided to roll the dice and set sail on an unprecedented undertaking. Spain, and Spain alone, would build its first modern submarine with a 100% Spanish design. <laughs> And so, on the 14th of March 2004, just nine days before the general elections, the Council of Ministers, which was in office, decided to entrust the Cartagena shipyard with the contract for the construction of four submarine S-80 class vessels, which, according to the government, meant employment in Cartagena for approximately a thousand people for 10 years. A decision that bore the seal of Frederico Trillo, the Minister of Defence, who just happened to have been born in Cartagena. The fact is that since then, the S-80 submersible has constantly been in danger of hitting the rocks. Originally scheduled to enter service in 2012, it is clear that the accumulated delays will amount to more than a whole decade. Have you ever heard of anything more Spanish in your life? So now many experts are wondering whether it was really such a good idea to undertake a project like this alone. For example, in February 2020, frigate captain Alfonso Carrasso Santos, who's been one of the main people in charge of the Navy's control of Navantia's S-80 project, published an article in the Revista General de Marina, in which he criticised the Navy's 2004 choice of the public company to make a completely new submarine without the help of France as a technological partner. The decision, in my opinion, was risky to bet on a shipyard with more than proven experience in the construction of surface craft, but with little experience in the complicated task of manufacturing such complicated devices and without the support of a technological partner. I believe that the shipyard was not critical enough regarding its real potential as a solo builder by separating itself from the French and as the sole architect of the project. Alfonso Carrasco Santos, frigate captain. So it would seem that the problems that have dragged the S-80 submarine under originated in a political decision that of wanting to build a 100% Spanish submarine, very technologically advanced, without either having the capacity, nor the expertise, nor the experience necessary to do so. Y los españoles, muy españoles, y mucho españoles. Muchas gracias. We don't know if Federico Trillo's decision was based on personal or political motives, perhaps to guarantee jobs and wealth in his hometown by securing the future of the shipyard, or was he simply trying to score some points in the region for his political party in the run-up to the elections? Of course, what Trillo could not have known is that, in the end, citizens would vote three days after the terrible 2004 Madrid train bombings and decide to kick out his party's government. But, my friends, now we know where this whole story began, let's see how Spain has tried to solve the serious problems of the S-80. Start over. As we've already told you, the biggest problem that the S-80 submarine has is that it can't float. And of course, at this point, many of you are probably wondering how on earth something like this could happen? Well, it's not exactly clear what happened. The waters are a little murky. But one of the explanations that has been given is that one of the engineers who worked on the initial design of the project made a basic miscalculation by mistyping where the decimal went. The result? The designed submarine was more or less 100 tons overweight. So, the Spanish Ministry of Defence had no choice but to turn to Captain America. They contracted the world's largest submarine manufacturer, General Dynamics Electric Boat, to audit the entire project. But of course, working for free is not very popular outside of Spain. The Navy will pay 14 million to the US economy that will advise Navantia on the problem of the overweight submarine, Europa Press. The outcome was that General Dynamics Electric Boat suggested a solution to solve the design problems of the submarine. 
had to be lengthened by 10 meters from 71 to 80.8 meters to compensate for the extra weight of the initial design. However, the studies left no room for doubt. Each meter added to the S80 meant raising the cost by $9 million. In other words, we are talking about 90 million more to produce each submarine. But since there was no other better option, the advice of the Americans was followed. However, some Spaniards wanted to have their say as well. Ah, right, right. The submarine is now almost 81 meters long, so we'll call it the S80 Plus. And that's exactly how these vessels are now known, the S80 Plus class. So my friends, surely the Ministry of Defence must have thought that with the help of the Americans, all the problems would disappear, right? As it turns out, they didn't. As Murphy's Law states, whatever can go wrong, will go wrong. And Murphy, like General Dynamics Electric Boat, was also an American engineer. 70 submarine batteries are stolen from the public company Navantia after being left at an unguarded warehouse, El Diario. However, Navantia was fortunate in that, naturally, it is kind of difficult to offload submarine batteries, so the thieves were quickly caught, and in the end, about 60 were recovered. As a result, this theft remains an unfortunate anecdote. Even more unfortunate is that the Navy was counting on having those submarines in 2012 to replace the S-70 class, the Galerna class submarines that were around 30 years old at the time. And that is when someone must have woke up from their siesta and thought, hey, Spain can't be left without submarines because, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but there's a lot of coastline around here. So what do you think they did? Well, logically, they reconditioned two veteran submersibles. After all, they basically didn't have another choice. But of course, we're not exactly talking about a budget option here. The hulling of a submarine costs around 45 million euros. It involves disassembling it completely, checking each part, and then reassembling it to ensure that safety requirements are met. Although the hulling of these three S-70 class submersibles was planned, the Ministry of Defence decided that two would be sufficient, so the final bill went up to 90 million euros. And now you're probably thinking, 90 million euros? That's about 109 million dollars. Is it too much or too little? I'm kind of sunk here. Well, look at it this way. Eden Hazard cost Real Madrid practically the same amount, and at least these subs move and do their job. The really important issue is that if the S80 Plus had respected its delivery deadlines, there would have been no need to make that additional outlay. At least now, there was peace of mind that everyone was straight about the correct calculations. Or maybe not. Are you sure? Spain's new submarine too big for its dock, BBC. But don't worry, friends of visual politic, because public works are one of Spain's specialties. Big problems require big solutions. But to be fair, not everything surrounding the S80 Plus is negative. This will be a magnificent submarine when it finally works. The question, of course, is when exactly that might be. That said, do you want to get to know the new jewel in the crown of the Spanish defense industry a little better? If so, then all aboard. All aboard. The S80 Plus class submarine has two fundamental advantages over classic submarines. The first is its ability to go unnoticed, thanks to having a very, very low magnetic and acoustic signature. In this aspect, propulsion plays a fundamental role. You have to understand that a conventional submarine is propelled by electric power. For this purpose, submarines have diesel engines that produce electricity. This electricity is used to power the batteries, which are then used underwater to operate and drive the electric motor that propels the submarine. But of course, the problem is that the batteries run out and the diesel engines need to exchange gases with the atmosphere. And of course, if we are talking about submarines, that means that they need to surface every few days to renew the air and charge the batteries. This greatly limits the submersible's underwater autonomy and makes them vulnerable as they are easier to detect. Therefore, shipbuilding companies are looking to develop an anaerobic propulsion system, an AIP, an air independent system, to incorporate alongside a traditional electric motor. This system extends the time a conventional submarine can remain underwater to three weeks, meaning the S80 Plus is halfway to the two months that nuclear submarines can remain without surfacing. To achieve this, Navantia has worked with another Spanish company, Abengoa. Goa has devised a novel technology that consists of processing bioethanol in a reformer to obtain hydrogen. This hydrogen is then used by a fuel cell to produce electricity, when necessary, without going to the surface. At the same time, the waste produced, carbon dioxide, is expelled into the water through a special waste extractor to minimise bubbles. So, so far, this all sounds great, right? But 
there is a problem. This 300 kilowatt AIP system, which costs about 80 million euros per unit, will not be available on the first two S80 Plus that the Spanish Navy will have. The reason is that, so far, it has only worked on small scale prototypes. So the intention is to later integrate the devices into those two submarines in a technical overhaul. But that won't be until 2026, which, considering Spain's progress, is at the earliest. Another interesting detail of the S80 Plus is that it is so technologically advanced that it can be manned by only 32 crew members, when usually almost twice as many crew members are needed. This is something that will allow the transport of, for example, an eight-member Special Forces Commando unit that could be deployed on amphibious missions from the submarine itself. In terms of armament, a combat system from the US company Lockheed Martin has been chosen. In addition, the S80 Plus has German torpedo launchers and the possibility of using Tom Hawk missiles, which would make it possible to attack land targets hundreds of kilometers away from under the water. So basically, we're talking about the best the international market has to offer, as long as it doesn't sink. It seems that when Spain gets serious, they have everything planned. Well, almost everything. Because the truth is that the Navy has been asking for Tomahawk missiles from the Ministry of Defense Santa for many, many Christmases. But so far, nothing. It seems impossible. Look at what the Navy Chief of Staff, Admiral Toledo Lopez Calderon, said months ago. Another native of Cartagena, by the way. As of today, it is not planned. There are no plans to acquire the Tomahawk missile. And what may happen in the future, I don't know, but not at this time. What I do know is that the submarine will have missiles with not only surface attack capability, but also ground attack capability. Obviously not like the Tomahawk, but the idea is that the acquisition of the Harpoon Block 2, which has ground attack capability. Being able to use the Tomahawk missiles is the second greatest advantage of the S-80 Plus submarines. In fact, years ago, the United States authorized their export to Spain. However, as you can see, everything indicates that this purchase will not materialize, thus leaving the new S-80 Plus a little bit of a sitting duck. Does it make sense to develop such an advanced submarine if you were then going to leave it limping in terms of operational capabilities? This question, my friends, remains up in the air, under the water? No one knows is what I'm trying to say. Mind you, there is one solution. At least you can export it. Of course, the problem is that with so many issues and the huge backlog it has accumulated, it has already been excluded from several international contracts. Navantia will not build four submarines for the the Netherlands because the S-80 is not yet a quote proven product. The international delivery of the S-80 Plus promises to be Spain's next headache. The delay threw them out of the race for the Netherlands, but the bad news just keeps on coming. Australia, possibly Navantia's best international customer, decided years ago to go for the French Barracuda, although it must be noted that these are nuclear submarines. So now, all efforts are focused on transferring the S80 Plus technology to developing countries, adapting it to the requirements of each customer. Navantia presents S80 Plus submarine for India's P-75I at the Underwater Defense and Security 2020 conference. The rivals to win this contract are fierce. The Germans, the French, the Russians, and the South Koreans. Is there a real chance for success of Navantia in India? Well, for that, we would have to take this project seriously. And it is complicated to do so when we review what we know. The submarine is scheduled to be launched in 2021, and there will be a long year of testing before being at the disposal of the Navy in 2023, clocking up a total of 11 years of delay. We also know that the first submarines will have neither the AIP propulsion system nor Tomahawk missiles, which are supposed to be two of their major features. Nor should we forget that the initial budget for this submarine program was around 2 billion euros and has now reached 3.9 billion euros, around 4.7 billion dollars. This means that each of the four submarines ordered by the Navy has gone from costing 440 million euros to 980 million euros. At that price, which is almost double what a submarine of this type usually costs, it will be difficult to place it in any country. But before we wrap up, let us make one observation, because there was something positive to come out of the decision taken at the time by Minister Trillo, and that is that time has shown that the successful formula of the consortium with France was exhausted. Let me explain. The approach of remaining a mere constructor, just another shipyard in the world, was doomed to failure. Today, countries no longer want to buy submarines manufactured in Europe. No, what they want to pay for is the design and for the technology transfer to provide employment for their own people, as has happened to France with the production of the Scorpion class for India and Brazil. 
it must also be recognised that innovation is complicated. Projects of this type, so technically and technologically complex, almost always entail delays and cost overruns. But we cannot lose sight of the fact that we are talking about taxpayers' money. And that leads us to think, seeing the delay of the project and its multi-million dollar cost overrun, that if Spain did not know how to make submarines, then maybe it would have been better to not have embarked on such a race, or at least not have gone it alone. Because building a submarine is not a simple mission, and no matter how many jobs it generates, if the final product is a failure, in the end, this investment basically amounts to little more than a way of subsidising jobs. But now, we want to hear your thoughts. To what extent do you think Spain has done the right thing by increasing its investment in this project? Do you think cost overruns are always justified in such complex projects? And, most importantly, will Spain finally build a submarine that floats? Leave your answer in the comments below. As always, we really hope you enjoyed this video, please hit like if you did and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos and now i'm sailing off to our next video see you next time and if you want to learn more about politics and hear even more of my lovely voice you can join us at reconsider media we have a podcast at reconsidermedia.com podcast see you there